This flight is fully narrated, and your flight can be too. Because I've started a new service where I can narrate your flight in real time via text using your aircraft's Wi-Fi. If you're on board a flight and are seeking more depth or knowledge about your specific flight, this service is for you. Just like this video, I'll take you step by step live to give you heightened awareness. Details on how to sign up are in the description below. Before you watch this video, check out my previous video that features the departure phase of this flight. Fully explained from the gate to the taxi to the runway and the climb, it's as comprehensive as you can get. And now this flight has advanced to the state of Florida, and I've got my camera pointed straight down to see the Georgia-Florida border. It's the inlet that you see below. On the left is Cumberland Island in Georgia, and on the right is Amelia Island in Florida. We're getting ready to fly the Thor 3 Arrival, the standard and only published arrival procedure used for the Daytona Beach International Airport in Central Florida's east coast. The arrival path has us descend out over the Atlantic Ocean, so I'm taking advantage of what I see down below now before only water becomes visible. We're looking at Fernandina Beach on Amelia Island. It's the northernmost city on the east coast of Florida and has a population of around 13,000. It's known for its southern charm and architecture from the Victorian era. It's located around 20 miles northeast of Jacksonville, the most populous city in Florida, and it's quite a contrast from the sprawl of Jacksonville. On Amelia Island, there are three communities, but we're only able to see Fernandina Beach from the angle at which we're flying. I'm looking down because I know that there's an airport down there, the Fernandina Beach Municipal Airport, and since we're nearly over it, I can see only the easternmost part of runways 22 and 27 at the bottom of my window. The island itself is a sea island, and it's part of a chain of islands from South Carolina extending right down to here. Amelia Island is named after Princess Amelia of Great Britain. And after this, there won't be much to see. The next video clip you'll see here will be uninterrupted until we land at the Daytona Beach International Airport. We're coming down from our cruising altitude and are talking to high altitude controllers physically located at the Jacksonville Air Route Traffic Control Center in Hillard, Florida. The controllers there are the ones who will have us start on down on the Thor arrival, which is used for multiple airports in the Orlando area. It's a rather straight arrival route, and you'll see here that we won't be making any major turns until we're near the airport. As we get closer and closer to Daytona Beach, the controller actually assigns us headings to fit into the traffic pattern. With many flight school aircraft flying into and out of Daytona Beach, the controller doesn't have the best picture of where we'll fit in until we're closer to the airport, and we've got a bit of a way to go first. Today, we'll be landing on runway 25 right because the wind is coming from the west, and that means we'll have to land to the west. The airport is only a few miles away from the Atlantic Ocean and the Intracoastal Waterway, so we'll be making a water approach before we turn back and land. And even though we're out over the water now, we'll be flying over the land soon, paralleling the coastline before going back out over the water and turning around to land on runway 25 right. For now, our nose is pointed inland toward Palm Coast, Florida, as we pass by St. Augustine just off the right side of this plane. Fortunately, passengers on both sides of this aircraft are going to get coastline views. The plan is for us to head inland just for a bit, almost directly towards the Daytona Beach Airport, and once we're a few miles away from the airport, we'll turn left out to sea and start a right downwind leg to runway 25 right. We'll continue for several miles out over the water, turn a right base leg, and then turn a right turn onto the final approach course, passing over the beach on final approach. Rather than flying toward the final approach course in a long right base leg now, these turns near the airport help us fit into the standard traffic pattern to Daytona Beach today. We're at 10,000 feet now, and the flight attendants are doing their safety check, ensuring that all passenger seatbelts are fastened, tray tables are up, seats are not reclined, and baggage is under all seats. Although, I didn't even notice the flight attendants because my eyes are glued to the window view. I'm all set for landing, and in the cockpit, the flight deck crew is checking in with the approach controller, who clears us down to lower altitudes. From here on, we'll just get radar vectors to the final approach course rather than follow an arrival procedure. The controller has us on radar and will guide us all the way down before handing us off to the local controller in the air traffic control tower at the airport. The controller keeps us on this heading for a while, realizing that the best way to get us into the pattern is just to keep flying closer and closer to the airport before having us turn out to the sea and back around. Schools like Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University are sending many pilots and student pilots out into the airspace, and they are all using the airspace around the airport. Some of them are doing practice landings or touch-and-goes where they land and immediately take off. The operation at the Daytona Beach Airport is so different from the operation at Atlanta where we took off from less than an hour ago. It's hard to tell when we're over the water, but we're descending lower and lower, and we're slowing down from our cruising speed as we need to go below 250 knots at this point. 
Passengers on the other side of the plane still have a view of the coastline, but the beach view is fleeting because the angle at which we're flying puts us closer and closer to land, and in around two minutes, the beach will be directly below the airplane, meaning that the beach will appear on our side of the plane shortly after that. I can't wait for that because I'll finally have more reference points on the ground. At this point, even though I'm looking out the window from my A seat, I occasionally looked to the right window by the F seats to see if I could see down, but this 737 is too wide for me to be able to see the beach, which is outside the right side and very close to us now. I did, however, see the mainland of Florida in the distance. At least I have the wing to look at now. It'll be nice to see how the wing surfaces change as we slow down and prepare for the landing configuration. Passengers on the right side of the plane can no longer see the beach because we're right over it now near Marineland on the border of St. John's and Flagler counties. Marineland was once home to a movie studio for underwater footage. Too bad no one can see it from up here. What can be seen in front of us by our pilots is Palm Coast, Florida, which we're rapidly approaching. Palm Coast is the most populous city in Flagler County and is rather new, being developed in 1969. We'll only see part of Palm Coast in a moment as we'll be very close to the ocean as we fly over land. By this point, I'm all eyes down because the beach should be appearing very soon below our left wing. It's a nice day here in Florida, so I'm expecting some good views and I'm excited to see something other than water. The beach should be appearing any second now. And there it is. I'll point the camera down so we can all see it. Specifically, we're looking at the Hammock Dunes part of Palm Coast, which is east of the Intracoastal Waterway. This is a private oceanfront golf community. On the other side of the aircraft, passengers can see the inland portions of Palm Coast where neighborhoods are broken down into letters, with each street starting with the same letter. We can also see the intracoastal waterway down there. Here it's known as the Matanzas River. Since there are few inlets to the ocean here, most boaters do their boating in the river itself rather than in open water. At this point, the Matanzas River takes a turn to make the barrier island very narrow, and the Daytona Beach Approach Controller issues us a turn to the left just to a few degrees so that we fly parallel to the beach. I'm grateful we did not get issued a turn too far or we'd be back over the ocean again. It all depends on how busy the airport is. The beach area down there is known as Painter's Hill, and there's no hill down there, of course. This is flat Florida, after all. Just past Painter's Hill is the Beverly Beach section. These areas are all accessible via route A1A, which runs along the Atlantic Ocean. A1A actually begins where this video began, in Fernandita Beach on Amelia Island. It continues all the way down to Key West. A1A is not continuous and is divided into seven separate sections. Following A1A South leads to the next city on the beach, Flagler Beach, which is named for Henry Flagler, who helped make Eastern Florida what it is today for tourists. He was the founder of Miami and Palm Beach. Flagler Beach is a retro-style beach area covering six miles of beach and features restaurants, shops, and of course surfing in the waves of the Atlantic Ocean. There's also a fishing pier that juts out into the ocean. It's a popular place for locals and tourists seeking a unique part of Florida with a rich history. We're approaching the central part of Flagler Beach and the east-west road below leads to the downtown part of Flagler Beach. Most of the businesses are along this road on the beach, and as we continue south, we can see that most of Flagler Beach is just a few blocks deep. Daytona Beach Approach Control is keeping us on this heading as we descend further. Above us are higher altitude flights also descending, but they're headed to Orlando area airports, which include Orlando International and Orlando Sanford. Regarding airline traffic, those airports are much busier than Daytona Beach. As a matter of fact, the route that I'm on now on Delta from Atlanta to Daytona Beach is the only route Delta offers from Daytona. American has service to Charlotte with seasonal service to Dallas and DCA while Avello flies to New Haven, and that's it. But it's the flight schools that make Daytona a very busy airport. At the bottom of the screen is the historic Bolo Plantation Ruins Historic State Park. Yes, there are ruins right here in Florida. There's an antebellum plantation down there in ruins. It was developed in 1821. Today, this is now a tourist attraction showcasing how sugar plantations developed then disappeared in East Florida. Other crops included indigo and rice. The locale was left for ruin after the Second Seminole War in the 1830s. This was a war between the United States and the Seminoles, a Native American group that still thrives in Florida as well as Oklahoma. This place is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The entire area down there just south of Flagler Beach is not heavily populated at all. If you drive south on A1A, you'll see the ocean off your left and trees on your right. It's an untouched portion of Florida where nature thrives. Just south of Flagler Beach, we enter Volusia County, the county of our destination of Daytona Beach, and the next town that we see on the barrier island is Ormond-by-the-Sea. It's here where the intracoastal waterway is now called the Halifax River. The population density is going to increase significantly on both sides of the Halifax River as we approach Ormond Beach, which is just north of Daytona Beach. 
Ormond Beach has a population of 43,000 and is known as the birthplace of speed. In the early days of motor vehicles, people would drive on the beach, a practice still done today, but in our case, we're reducing our speed as we slow down as the controller finds the right place to have us turn to the left to join a right downwind leg for the airport. That left turn will happen in one minute, and I'm looking forward to it as I'll get a nice view of Ormond Beach. The controller has vectored other aircraft into the straight approach course to runway 25 right and will have us enter the pattern under complete control momentarily. We're the largest aircraft coming into Daytona Beach at the moment, and we're mixing with smaller corporate jets as well as flight school aircraft. We're moving faster than some of these small planes, so we'll have to proceed far out enough over the ocean before turning back around to land. We don't want to overtake anybody. And anybody behind us needs to be at a significant distance since we're a big plane and can contribute to wake turbulence. The Daytona Beach Airport, as well as the famous Daytona International Speedway, are directly in front of us, and if we were lower, we could technically land straight in on runway 16, but it's only 6,000 feet long. We're going to land on the big runway today, which is over 10,000 feet long. We're not lined up with it at all and are still high, so the time has come for us to turn out to sea as we descend lower so this 737-900 can get on the ground. This turn is around 90 degrees to the left and will point us in the opposite direction of landing. This is called the downwind leg, and even though we're in a left turn, it's called a right downwind leg as we'll be making right turns for the remainder of the flight in a right traffic pattern to the runway, just like everyone else. By the wing is the Grenada Boulevard Bridge. That's around the center of Ormond Beach, so we're lucky that this turn gives us a great view of the main part of town. Passengers seated on the other side of the plane can see the Daytona Beach Airport as well as the Speedway, which is adjacent to the airport, but when you're making a left-hand turn, the left side's easier to see. And as we complete the turn, we can see up the Florida coast, exactly where we just flew. Just off the left side of the winglet is the Ormond Beach Municipal Airport, which was built in 1943. This is a general aviation airport, which means that there's no airline surface. Its longest runway is 4,000 feet, so larger planes tend to use the Daytona Beach Airport or the Palm Coast Airport in Bunnell. We're about to fly over the Halifax River, and Ormond Beach, despite having beach in its name, occupies both sides of the river. The island is a barrier island that's so common up and down eastern Florida's coastline. We're going to proceed out several miles before the controller turns us back to the right behind the flight we're following. To the untrained eye of a passenger, it may seem odd that we're headed out over the water since we're just over the land, but this is the only way to get lined up with the runway several miles out. Now that there's less to point out while over the water on the downwind leg, I want to remind you that if you enjoy this narration, I can do this with you in real time while you're aboard your airliner equipped with Wi-Fi. Things like I'm saying here can be sent to you by me via text message to make you gain a complete understanding of not just what's below you, but how you are sharing the sky with other airplanes, bringing you to where you are. To sign up for this one-of-a-kind service, there are details in the description below. I'm getting great feedback so far from this, and I'm enjoying every moment of it, and I'm sure you will too. If you're not flying anytime soon, don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button so that you can join me right here on YouTube the next time I take to the skies. All of my videos are completely narrated with the most detailed explanations you'll find of any passenger. We've got one minute left on the downwind leg before we turn to the right to head south. Passengers seated on the right-hand side of the plane have the opportunity to view the final approach course to the airport, so with a careful eye, they can see aircraft flying lower than us in the opposite direction, coming into the airport in a straight and approach. We'll be there momentarily ourselves, and while we're on final, those passengers can look up to see planes where we are right now. There's a whole ecosystem of coordinated flights out here over the water, but our side of the aircraft doesn't afford us the view of other arrivals to Daytona Beach today. For us, it's just open water. But both sides of the plane will get low altitude beach views while we're on final approach. There's so much to discover outside while flying, and I noticed that most passengers have their eyes shut. They don't know what they're missing. This has been a short and simple, yet delightful flight so far, and it's not over yet. This 737 has a landing that needs to be accomplished. Now that we've flown the downwind leg, the controller sees that there's enough space between us and the traffic ahead, so a turn to the south is issued. This is the right base leg, and it brings us toward the final approach course, which will intercept in another right-hand turn. Once we're on the base leg, the controller will either issue us clearance for an instrument approach, or will ask the flight deck crew if they have the runway in sight, and will issue us clearance for a visual approach to the runway. In either case, we will intercept the final approach course via a right-hand turn, and will get cleared down to the minimum altitude allowed for starting the approach. 
Now, we'll be landing on runway 25 right, which is parallel to runway 25 left. Runway 25 left is just over 3,000 feet long and can accommodate this Boeing 737, so it's the long runway that we'll aim for. There are a total of three runways at the Daytona Beach Airport, and I've only seen airlines ever land on the long runway. The same runway in the opposite direction is runway 7 left, which is used when the wind is coming from the opposite direction. We need a headwind to land, and that's what we've got today as the wind is coming from the west. Flying at this point with the wings leveled is the right base leg and passengers seated on the right side could potentially see the airport if they look closely enough, or they could see the racetrack, which is very prominent and next to the airport. We're just about ready to make the right hand turn back towards the airport and land. We need to make sure we don't overshoot the turn because that would require us to make some S turns to get lined up with the extended center line. So the right turn is not the final turn. We'll make two turns, this one and then a smaller turn so that we can intercept the approach course at a gentle angle rather than overshoot it. We're now handed off by the approach controller to the controller at the top floor of the Daytona Beach Air Traffic Control Tower. The top of the tower is 149 feet. That's a lot smaller than the tower at Atlanta where we took off from. The tower controller, known as the local controller, will issue us landing clearance once it's deemed that we can land safely. Not only does the tower controller have us in radar, the controller can also see us out the window. Unlike when we took off and are immediately handed off to a radar room controller, when approaching an airport, the controller can see the aircraft land within several miles of the airport. In the cockpit, final checklists for landing are being conducted. This includes lowering the landing gear and checking to make sure that it's down and in the locked position. It's a nice day here in eastern Florida and it's nice to see the sun reflecting off the water. This is the view that passengers on the other side of the plane saw when we were on the downwind light. We're getting lower and slower over the Atlantic and will soon reach our final approach speed on the land. The runway is ahead and slightly to the right, so one very small right turn needs to be made so that the runway is directly in front of us. After this tweak, the next turn we'll be making will be the turn off of the runway on the ground, and the pilots have already looked at the airport diagram to plan ahead to determine which taxiway they can potentially use to vacate the runway on. The idea is to get off the runway as quickly as possible so that other aircraft, both arrivals and departures, can use the runway. Dwell time on any runway should be minimal. Even if the pilot knows which taxiway in advance they'd like to vacate on, the tower controller, however, could assign them another taxiway. That instruction is typically issued once the aircraft has slowed down. Just over the wing, you can see the beaches of Daytona Beach. I've already mentioned the Speedway, which is home to NASCAR and the famous Daytona 500, but the other thing that Daytona is famous for is the beach itself. If you Google the world's most famous beach, Daytona Beach will show up in the search results. First, it's a popular vacation destination, especially for young spring breakers. And the other thing that makes this beach famous is its hard sand, allowing cars to be driven on it. Yes, I did mention that this can be done in Ormond Beach, but it doesn't get the fame of Daytona, as spring break and the speedway play a big role in its popularity. It's quite unique to drive on a beach, and you don't get that opportunity on most beaches throughout the world. The population of Daytona Beach is around 72,000, but many more people come from the outside to visit, of course. It's also an aviation city, hosting Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Embry-Riddle is the fifth largest employer in the area after the typical large employers of schools, healthcare, and government. Students from all over the world come to Daytona to attend Embry-Riddle, so yes, Daytona is a famous place. This video has been continuous since we made landfall over Palm Coast, and I won't stop it until we land, so I want you to pay very close attention to the beach, which we're rapidly approaching. If you look carefully, and the beach will appear suddenly since the wing obscures the forward view, you'll notice vehicles on the beach. Most of the vehicles will be parked as beachgoers get out and enjoy the water, but they can use their cars for shade without having to set up umbrellas. Today, the driving speed limit is 10 miles per hour. It's needed because there are pedestrians and sunbathers on the sand, too. Okay, get ready for this. The water is becoming shallower and shallower, and we're all ready to make our low approach over the world's most famous beach. We're now crossing the Halifax River. This is the Intracoastal Waterway, and it's nice and wide here. It can be very narrow at other points. You can see some boats in the river before we reach the mainland. We are now over the High Bees Daytona neighborhood on final approach to runway 25 right. By this point, the runway ahead should be clear and ready to accept this Boeing jet. The approach light system can be seen extending from the runway center line directly ahead of us. We're almost on the ground. We're aiming for the touchdown point, which is right around the spot where our runway intersects with the crosswind runway, runway 1634. You'll recall we were pointed toward that runway before we headed out over the water to join the approach to runway 25 right. Runway 25 right is really long at 10,500 feet. It's 150 feet wide. 
We won't be needing the entire length of the runway for landing, but it's nice to have it there for us. Once we slow down and vacate the runway, we'll have to make a 180 and head in the opposite direction of the taxiway because that's where the airline terminal is. At the terminal, ramp agents are being made aware of the fact that we're landing and are headed out to the ramp to guide us in. With light traffic, it's a short period of time from the landing roll to pulling into the gate. It's time to touch down on the runway right at the intersection of the crosswind runway. Notice the air traffic control tower. It's small, but controllers up there can get really busy with all the student pilot activity. We're starting to slow down, but since we have a lot of runway, there's no need for any hard braking. Check out my video where my airliner lands in Florence, Italy. It has a super short runway, and we came to a stop in 15 seconds. Here we have more room, and the less than extreme braking is comfortable for all passengers. Our landing roll today has us roll down to taxiway November 4, which we will use to the right to bring us onto taxiway November so we can parallel the runway in the opposite direction to get to the airline terminal. There's a big gap between taxiway November 4 and the previous exit taxiway, which is why we moved down the runway at a nearly taxi speed before vacating. There just wasn't any place to exit before this. The local tower controller now tells us to switch to the ground controller, who's also located in the tower. The ground controller tells us to use taxiway November and then Charlie 2 to enter the ramp and pull into the gate. I'm excited about our taxi to the gate because it will afford me a view of the Daytona Speedway, home of the Daytona 500. The airport is right next to the Speedway and although you can't see the track from the taxiway system, you can see the grandstands. That's it there, just past the water. We'll take the second taxiway on the left to the ramp as instructed by the controller. The second taxiway provides more direct access to our gate. You'll notice that the ramp is really big, but the terminal itself only has six gates. This leaves room for expansion. Should more gates need to be added, the concourse can potentially be expanded and more gates can be added on either side. But the demand for that is not high just yet. Throughout the years, many airlines have served this airport on various routes that don't exist today. This includes carriers like current airlines JetBlue and Silver Airways. Several FBOs, or fixed base operators handling corporate flights and private flights, operate here but at different locations. Well, I'm going to end this video here. Remember that if you've got a ticket for an airline flight with Wi-Fi, consider bringing me along with you in real time for your flight. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss out on my next journey filmed just for you. Thanks, everybody, and see you soon on an airplane.